Hi everyone, Dr. Simon Freilich here, and I'll be talking about a condition called brachial neuritis, it's also known as Parsonage Turner syndrome, amongst others, and uh, well, let's get into it right now. The first thing to say about this condition is that there are challenges in communicating about it because it has so many different names. I've just called it brachial neuritis, which means inflammation of the brachial nerves. It's also known as Parsonage Turner syndrome after Parsonage and Turner, who were not the first to actually describe it, but uh, it's stuck with their names. It's also known as neuralgic amyotrophy, which means painful wasting of the muscles. And it's also known more colloquially as acute shoulder neuritis, which means inflammation of the nerves of the shoulder. It's a fairly rare condition affecting between one and three per hundred thousand of the population. And because of that, people in general don't have much experience with it in an acute setting. So it's fairly poorly recognized in the initial stages and it's therefore poorly studied as well. And because of all of the above, it's difficult to perform uh, you know, prospective randomized control uh, studies in order to develop the best treatment methods for it. And we'll talk a little bit more about that soon. What is the brachial plexus? The brachial plexus is the group of nerves that sits just behind the collarbone over here, and it essentially merges the individual nerves that come out of the uh, neck spaces um, and puts them together in order that they can then come down to form the individual nerves of the arm and the shoulder. So that's what the brachial plexus is. And so brachial neuritis or Parsonage Turner syndrome reflects inflammation within the group of nerves over here. Now, where the inflammation occurs tends to affect the upper parts of that um, co congregation almost um, of nerves. And that basically corresponds on the whole to the muscles and, and the nerves to the muscles of the shoulder region um, and the upper arm. Now, usually this affects just one arm, but about a third of people actually have its effects on the other arm as well. Often it may even be a subclinical thing, something that's only detected uh, with neurophysiology studies. But um, on the whole, it tends to affect just one arm at a time and mainly affects men in a ratio of about two to four to one, um, according to uh, studies in the literature. In terms of the clinical presentation, it has a fairly abrupt onset of very extreme pain, very, very bad, usually opioid kind of level of pain. Now, rarely, about 10 to 15 percent, this actually may be painless, and that's where it becomes atypical and it gets a bit more harder to actually diagnose. But for the most part, it's an extremely uh, painful presentation, and that's where the neuralgic bit comes from, the neuralgic amyotrophy. And then the next bit is, is that there's very severe and very rapid weakness and wasting of the affected muscles, that's the amyotrophy bit from the neuralgic amyotrophy term. Now, as I said already, it primarily affects the nerves in the upper part of the plexus and therefore primarily affects the uh, muscles of the shoulder and uh, of the upper arm too. Now, it has a predilection for the nerves that are the motor fibres, those are the nerves that go to the actual muscles, and therefore people tend to have more motor weakness and therefore uh, weakness of the, the muscles rather than sensory impairment um, because um, that's just how the condition presents itself. In terms of the clinical course, it is extremely painful for usually the first four weeks, and then it sort of gradually becomes a bit less painful over the next six to 10 weeks, and then sort of gradually subsides after that. Now, people can be left with chronic discomfort from shoulder instability if the shoulder muscles um, become uh, weak and wasted, and that can lead to uh, misuse of the, uh, of the shoulder itself, and these are sort of chronic pain syndromes from that as well. But the severe pain is really at the very beginning of the uh, course of this um, illness, and um, it tends to sort of die away over the coming sort of three months or so. In terms of the causes, for the vast majority, it is a sporadic event, it's a one-off thing, and it very rarely recurs. Now, there are some people in who this condition will recur, um, and it can be very, very, very rarely a hereditary issue, um, in which case there tends to be a family history of it already happening, it tends to occur at a younger age. Most people with Parsonage Turner syndrome will have it sort of age 40 plus, uh, but if it's a very much a, a younger presentation, then one has to think about familial causes, um, in which case it's the SEPT9 gene, which tends to be the one that uh, 
is uh, the culprit for it. Uh, it tends to be recurrent and also are some dysmorphic features and that basically means um, that the person's anatomy is a little bit different to uh, most people in general. Now for about 30 percent of people there may be a preceding infection whether it's like an influenza type of thing upper respiratory tract infection maybe a post vaccination thing may even be related to physical activity surgery childbirth and a whole host of minor footnotes uh, but on the most part it tends to be sort of post infectious uh, that is the precipitating factor if any that can be identified the actual diagnosis itself is a clinical diagnosis for the most part and really reflects a very abrupt onset. Um, it's quite a patchy process, so often it will affect multiple or even single nerves rarely, but it is not a dermatomal issue, and basically that sort of helps to differentiate it away from being a neck issue. And of course, it's not affected by neck positioning. There are a couple of differential conditions uh, for this when it comes to making the clinical diagnosis. So there are rotator cuff issues, uh, which tend to be a little bit more gradual in onset uh, than this sort of very abrupt, very painful thing that happens really out of the a bolt out of, of, of lightning out of the blue. Um, whereas people with rotator cuff issues on the whole tend to have niggles in their shoulders and they run up to this. Certainly there is no uh, muscle wasting per se with rotator cuff issues. It's more of a tendon type of issue over there rather than a nerve muscle wasting issue. Certainly rotator cuff issues are limited to the shoulder muscles. So if there's wasting further down, then obviously that points away from that. And of course, there's no sensory deficit uh, either with rotator cuff issues. The uh, difficulty can actually really become with people who've got cervical radiculopathy. So that's when there's degeneration of the neck. And in that scenario, the pain usually starts in the neck itself. It's worsened by neck movements. And of course, it will follow a dermatomal pattern. But it can get confusing, it can be tricky, it can be difficult. But the, the real key feature, uh, which really sort of puts this apart from the, the neck issues on the whole, um, tends to be the severity of the pain. So in terms of investigations, some say one doesn't need to have very much in terms of investigations. Obviously, I'm a neurophysiologist, um, so I will be pushing the neurophysiology uh, viewpoint here. But I think it's very useful because, number one, it gives a positive diagnosis as to what's going on. It's very useful to determine the extent of what's been affected, particularly if one's looking for subclinical involvement on the other side. Um, it can certainly establish the severity of what's um, happened and certainly can help with predicting the eventual outcome. It can also be very helpful to exclude mimics as well. MRI scans, when they do happen, tend to have occurred to exclude mimics such as radiculopathy, that's the degenerative neck issues. Um, one can certainly image the brachial plexus itself and look for certain changes there uh, as well, but that's mainly to exclude lesional causes uh, by and large. CSF might be something that people occasionally have, but usually it's not terribly helpful or not usually performed. So by and large, the investigation that tends to happen is neurophysiology. From personal experience, this is something that tends to happen uh, several weeks at least down the line after one's already seen a number of uh, other specialists. And so we don't tend to see this from our, our personal perspective uh, for at least a couple of months down the line um, on the whole. There are occasions where we do get to see this early, but uh, by and large, we only see it when it's already well established. In terms of the treatment, um, it's usually recognised too late to be doing anything particularly meaningful with it. Now, there is a Cochrane review uh, going back to 2009 where there is some anecdotal evidence which they recognise for giving early steroids. And that particular study, uh, there was some evidence to show there was a reduction in the pain that people had. So the length of time people had severe pain was reduced and also the uh, recovery and sort of long term impairment was, uh, was less than those who didn't receive any treatment. But having said that, that was a retrospective type of study, it's relatively small numbers and uh, overall has been uh, regarded as anecdotal. Um, now one of the, the real issues with all of this is, as I said, it's a very rare condition, it's poorly recognised and if we were to compare the situation with, for example, Bell's palsy, where again there's inflammation of the uh, cranial nerves um, going to the facial muscles, what happens there is, is there is a good evidence basis to actually give steroids in the very short term, but that's relatively more common than the scenario over here. So unfortunately, I think that the evidence base may be limited by the fact that most medical practitioners will only actually get to this diagnosis um, several weeks, even months down the line. So I think that's uh, something that we can certainly 
hope to try and address in the future, um, but uh, for the moment, unfortunately, there's only anecdotal evidence to support this. Um, and in addition to which, the other um, anti-inflammatory routes, uh, anti-immunological uh, therapies, again, similarly, do not have an evidence base um, at this moment in time, but presumably for a similar reason, because the damage is already done. So for the most part, it's really a question of pain relief, which will be suitable analgesics. I've already alluded to it's a very, very painful situation. Um, people may need to be on various opioid type of analgesics. Um, that's obviously quite um, a difficult uh, thing with the opioid crisis that we're facing at the moment, but actually it's that severity of pain uh, that has to be recognized and has to be appropriately treated. Obviously, you know, one only gives what is required, but uh, it's important to bear in mind that often one actually does have to give quite strong analgesics to uh, mitigate the severity of the pain that people will be experiencing with this. There's a place for non-steroidals here and neuroleptics such as pregabalin, gabapentin, uh, and all in terms of controlling the level of pain. Uh, but as I've already said, um, the severity of the pain will actually uh, reduce fairly substantially over the three month period. Um, hopefully for, for most people it should be substantially less than that, but in terms of the real severity of the pain, so the sort of banging your head against the wall because it's just so terrible, um, that's for the first couple of weeks really and then that sort of tails down. So people really do need to be supported uh, and this has to be recognised early on to give people adequate support through this very painful period. Um, but then the analgesics have to be tailored and, and um, they have to be tapered down as the condition settles down itself. Now, as the condition settles down, um, physical therapy, physiotherapy is really very important here in order to uh, best use the shoulder muscles, uh, in particularly if they've been affected um, or whatever's been uh, particularly affected, you know, to, to sort of mitigate any further damage to those muscles or to those joints and to try and improve function. It's not a cure, but it's very important to recognise that one has to use what one has appropriately and not overstrain that which one has. Now, for the hereditary form of this, there is some um, evidence that there may be a role for prophylaxis um, pre-surgery or pre-childbirth with either steroids or with various uh, immunosuppression uh, regimens uh, for this. But that's something where there's a very early literature for and uh, certainly isn't um, mainstream practice per se, but it's certainly a, a conversation and a talking point for those who are affected by that. So um, I hope this has been a, a useful video. I hope that's explained a little bit about this condition. Obviously, this isn't really particularly good news for anybody who has it because it's a very painful condition, but it is something that does um, remit, certainly in terms of the pain, uh, with the course of time. In terms of the prognosis for recovery, uh, usually this is something that really resolves um, over a period of uh, 12 to 18 months as nerves recuperate and regenerate themselves. Um, but again, the extent of recovery and recuperation very much depends um, on how severe the nerves are affected in the first place and how much wasting there is. And so it's very difficult to predict for any individual person what their particular recovery is going to be like, uh, particularly if you want to uh, ask a question of me um, regarding this. So um, please do support the channel by liking, sharing and subscribing. Really value your support. Uh, try and give you um, some evidence-based uh, information over here on the internet. Uh, that's really what I'm out to do. Um, as I've said, I really can't help with individual um, sort of queries. You know, I've had some passage turn, I've had break on neuritis, um, and it's affected me X, Y and Z. What's my prognosis? I can't answer that for you, unfortunately. Uh, that's something that you know has to be discussed with your uh, local physician. Um, for all of you who uh, do follow the channel on a more regular basis, um, I thank you for your support. If you do have questions about other conditions, please do keep them with the other conditions. I do see them uh, over there, but uh, I try and keep everything uh, together. So if you've got questions about brachial neuritis in general, please do feel free to ask questions about that over here. If you've got questions about uh, benign fasciculations or whatever other condition that you're interested in, uh, please do keep them with the other videos. I do appreciate that and it just sort of helps keep everything in an appropriate place. So thank you very much and I look forward to seeing you in the next video in due course. All the very best.